then you have the power to get um, blow jobs basically from the corporate leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I found myself um, being blown by uh, America's film corporations. It's nice. Yeah? Yeah. I come in their fucking lens. I still want to ask you something about that, what I just said, that self-destructiveness. Because I once talked about Forrest, right after he did a big show in Holland, and he climbed up some, I don't know, very high thing, almost fell, and he survived, and yeah, he was very that. crazy. He was wearing my clothes. He was wearing your clothes? That whole tour. <laughs> I'll die soon anyways, and I won't, I won't have to explain myself. You serious about that? Yeah. Because you mentioned that too during the show. You said, who's afraid of uh, dying. dying? You're not? No. Not really. So at some point you expressed, you said, uh, during the show, you said you want to give people their money's worth. Yeah. That's yeah. your idea. I don't know. You pay a lot of money, you come see bands, and you can listen to their records. Let's, let's take, for instance, the real rock and rollers. Would you like to end up like Paul McCartney? I'd rather be dead than be Paul McCartney, I'll tell you that. Or Phil Collins, or any of that. And so, you know, just try to... I know it sounds like some melodramatic, ridiculous thing, like uh, trying to be Jim Morrison or whatever, but... Okay, here's the thing. Yeah. When I was a kid... I read the book, uh, Ladies and Gentlemen, Lenny Bruce, right? When I was 13 years old, all I wanted to do was shoot heroin. Like, that's what I wanted, because that was my idol. And then, then I found Keith Richards, and I found all these other people, Graham Parsons, all the melodrama that went on through pop culture in yep. America for 20 years. I ate it up, because I didn't have parents, and I didn't have anybody to depend on or to ask questions to. So Lenny Bruce and Graham Parsons and Keith Richards became my role models right so and then thus if i live like that it's not me that, like consciously getting up in the morning well i'm gonna drink and i'm gonna take some drugs it's just me just because it's the way that i grew up you know it's the way that i formed my ideas boy where is this going <laughs> a confession right <laughs> Okay, you want me to say something soulful? Drugs, I'm a junkie and I love shooting up and I'm and that, that means I'm self-destructive and, you know, is that good enough? <laughs> I don't know, did you feel it was a true statement or? Yeah. Oh. Oh, to a disaster Nerl the strong winds tied to a door I was wondering about the David Bowie Black book. What's that? You read that too? Yeah, and and uh, well, I just look at the pictures. I don't read it. I've just always loved looking at pictures of David Bowie. The only stuff I would read is when I was 17 and I would buy coke on the streets every day. I would, whatever days I, you know, I was starving so I didn't have money. But I would manage, and days that I couldn't manage, I would, uh, I would, I would like, uh, since I really wanted to do coke, I would just look up all the sections in the Bowie biography that I had in the index where it says cocaine and then just look up all the parts about cocaine and read them to, so I would feel like having coke, you know. But yeah, I just, I mean, they're looking at the pictures.
Why did, why did you... Uh, That's him and Iggy Pop. All right. Uh-huh. It's a nice one. They think something's funny. Why did you want to uh, be on coke so badly, then? Because it's great. Because it made me feel great. Mm -hmm. And plus, I just thought it was cool. I just thought David Bowie like did his coolest stuff when he was on a lot of coke, and um, and that stuff and that that feeling and that image is just the whole reason I got into rock and roll in the first place. Like bisexuality and and drugs were the two things in life that I related to rock and roll in my overall image of it when I was. Uh, nine or ten years old when I got into punk rock you know that was my whole that was that was the whole world that I felt within me that wasn't going on around me at school that made me feel like I had no reason to exist that in rock and roll that was part of everyday living and that that gave me a reason to, to live to feel like I actually did have a place where other people felt the same feelings for life that I did. Mm. And so when I was 17, I had never really done any drugs in my whole life and moved to Hollywood and decided that instead of practicing guitar 10 to 15 hours a day, which is what I had been doing for five years, I was just going to live life and do cocaine and wear makeup every day. I wore makeup every day then. And just, you know... I would go buy it from Mexican guys and be wearing like full makeup, you know, and pink pants. And the, my Mexican guy thought I was cool all the time. Like <laughs> I would argue with guys I didn't even know, just like that. But d have you never wondered uh, about this drug thing? What it is in people, or in somebody like you, or others? There's many others that they they have to have add this something to their body that changes them and alters them. Well, every second alters you. Every single thing you've ever seen alters you. Yeah. Everything you eat alters you. Okay, okay, but that's an extreme way of altering yourself. I don't think so. I think a parent yelling at you is an extreme way of altering yourself. I think somebody kicking you in the thighs is is is, is your one you look up to as being the role model of ma of masculinity. I think that alters you. Mm hmm. Well, you you're referring to your to your own parents or what? No, oh. not necessarily. Oh. I'm referring to everybody's everybody's parents. Uh, you know, make some sort of mistakes, and have some sort of sense of carelessness when it comes to developing their child's sexuality. Hmm. And their and their brain, like it's co what's considered smart to the world and parents is like memorizing things and doing good in school and what I've come to find is what smart is is being able to trip out you know that's using more parts of your brain that's your subconscious at work that's lining up thoughts that are that uh, and doing really intense things to your whole existence here and in all your other lives that are going on simultaneously you know that's what smart is not just memorizing something a monkey can do that mm. so drugs just just help that I did it my whole life kiss was the first time I really tripped out on music you know where it just really took me to a magical place mm -hmm. and drugs are just just uh, go along with that you know mm. I don't think of it as any sort of heavy alteration that hurts you it's like Oh, if I snort a line of coke, like, oh, God, that was terrible. I, I wish, God, I wish I hadn't done that in front of you. Oh, oh. awful. Are you okay? I, I think I'm going to be okay. <laughs> okay, but now you just said you're, you're shooting up, you're using heroin. I mean, what about that? That's, that's something pretty heavy, isn't it? I, people say so. I, I don't know what that means, really. Like, I don't think of it as being any sort of naughty thing or anything. Uh -huh. What does it mean to you? It's just a way of uh, making sure you stay in touch with beauty instead of letting the ugliness of the world corrupt your, your soul. Hmm. 
And, and you, you don't care if that destroys your body or doesn't it? I don't it doesn't know. destroy my body. I no. feel great. If I didn't feel great, I'd change the way I live. I'd start running or something. Mm. I'd feel great. I have lots of energy. I'm writing all the time, writing music all the time, developing, you know, developing my brain, uh, widening my appreciation of art of all kinds and being a nicer person always working on being a nicer person <laughs>